facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Hello and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we have Professor Gary Mitkiff, one of my favorite guests that have been coming on the show. This is about your third time, I believe. It is my third time, yes. And um, we're so happy to have you back, Thank Gary. You. Uh, we've had so much, we have so much to talk about today. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to probably get through everything that we are thinking about because, you know, there it seems like everything changes day by day right now and we got to catch up a little bit and i noticed that you belong to the foreign policy association yes which is a national group and i see that we have that under your name today and maybe you could get a, you know start our program out with telling a little bit about the foreign policy association Foreign Policy Association started in the 1920s and it's dedicated to supporting community discussions of foreign policy. It publishes the Great Decisions Program, which is a program uh, that many libraries and senior living communities support, as well as supporting speakers that come into their headquarters in New York City. So I am affiliated with a number of places that do the Great Decisions Program and work with the Foreign Policy Association. That sounds very interesting. It is. And um, I think right now we need people like you, more people like you, to kind of decipher what is going on, what is real news from the so-called, they call it fake news. I don't know if that's uh, a terminology that they use uh, at the Foreign Policy Association. Is there such a thing as fake news? There absolutely is. And one of the things that I stress in the groups that I lead is that all of us, you and I and everyone listening, needs to multi-source our news. If we only listen to a single source, if we only read the New York Times or we only read the Wall Street Journal, we're not getting a full picture. So we need to listen to folks who disagree with us and then we might learn a little bit more. The only problem that I, I see is that I'll, I'll turn on one station and I'll talk about, like something that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about China and we're going to talk about Russia and we're going to talk about a lot of things. And if you turn on, say, MSNBC or CNN or Fox News, they'll tell you one thing and say, oh, that's what's really happening. And then you turn on the other station and it's completely opposite of what's happening. And you're wondering, you know, I've been in journalism for a long time and I've been doing uh, the shows for, uh, the public assets shows for, I, I would say about eight years already. And it's really hard for us, you know, it always sounds right. And then I'll turn on another station and it's completely say it's wrong. How do one, you know, just can decipher who's right and who's wrong? You have to suspend judgment and not try to determine who's right and wrong, but listen to perspective. And then as you get different perspectives, it's up to the listener to piece together what makes sense and do additional research. I tell my discussion groups that I reference 22 sources of news on a given month, and not all of them agree with each other, but if I read them and synthesize, I can get closer to the truth. But we can't, I'm afraid, go to any one source. There isn't a Walter Cronkite of truth. That would be nice. <laughs> 
but he doesn't exist. He doesn't exist no, anymore. No, I'm afraid not. Brinkley, Cronkite. That would be the, nice, but they're are not the, with us anymore, so we can't rely on them. Yeah, so there, there's, we didn't go to many sources in those days. We went to Cronkite or, or you know, John Cameron Swayze, remember him? There were just a yeah. few sources of news, and now there are many, which is why we have to be careful and blend together perspectives. And also when I do my current, uh, I do a current events for uh, the Highwood Library, I try to, one person I call on is a Democrat, the next person I'll call on is a Republican. So we could always hear two points of view. Doesn't mean they're both right, it doesn't mean they're both wrong, it's just another perspective. And you're right. And then if somebody doesn't agree, I always tell them to look up some of their sources on their own and see what they can come up with. And one of our things that we're going to do today is talk about North Korea and what really is happening in North Korea. And I found one source that I talked to you a little bit earlier about, which was that came from the um, the Wall Street Journal, and it was an editorial that uh, I thought I wanted to point out. It talked about North Korea is the second best thing that has happened to China. The first being American manufacturing shifting to its shores. China lets North Korea do China's dirty work to make trouble for America. And is it hard to believe that North Korea has developed its strong nuclear capability without any assistance from China? And that was a mouthful because, you know, we're, it's, it's almost like I mentioned earlier, it's like going to the pediatrician's office, he never gives a shot. The nurse gives a shot. So she's the bad guy with the, ba with the wearing the black hat. And the doctor always, uh, the pediatrician always winds up to being the good guy, the good cop, the white hat guy. And so uh, what really is China doing in North Korea? Are they really, are they really helping them? Are they a foe? Are they really helping the United States deal with them? Uh, is, is, are they ready to bomb us, you know, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, okay, United so you've, States? Okay, so you've opened up like 15 topics. That's so right. So we have to stop for a minute so <laughs> okay, I can Okay, taking can respond. my breath. Take, you so take a breath. I'll take step my in breath now. Okay, for Gary to respond. Okay, here we go. First of all, uh, Kim Jong-un is rational. Uh, he absolutely has a direction he's moving in. And he's doing it in a calculated way. So we need to disabuse ourselves of the thought that he is irrational. He might be immature, but he is not irrational. Kim Jong-un in North Korea wants two things. First of all, he wants regime continuity. And number two, he wants to be sure he is not invaded from the South, some combination of the U.S. and South Korea. And what he is doing is, a, is accomplishing both of those goals. When he is nuclear capable and he can deliver a nuclear weapon to our continent, not just a rocket, then he'll be in a position to say, you're not going to attack me because I can defend myself. My regime is safe and I have achieved what it is that I wish to achieve. This has no impact on China. China's concern will be twofold. First, if there is any sort of conflagration on the peninsula and there's a large number of refugees from North Korea that stream into China, China does not want that, which is why they moved a number of military divisions up to the border to be sure that if there is a problem, they will not come across. Because there are a couple that came in from North Korea just recently. There are a couple of defectors. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people from North Korea fleeing north if there is a war in the peninsula. China does not want that. China also does not want a democratic country on its borders. If you look at the map of China, there are a number of countries that have a border with it, and except for about a quarter of an inch where it touches India, all of those countries are non-democratic and China would not want a democratic Korean peninsula on its border. It's happy having Korea as a buffer state. So China has no risk and no concerns. China, if it wanted to, could shut down North Korea. 75 to 80 percent of North Korea's economy is based upon China's trade. China could stop the trade and force a regime change. Doesn't want to, because the regime in North Korea doesn't threaten China at all. 
They're more concerned if there is a military outbreak. Then why are they not saying that to the United States? Why are they playing along and saying, oh, yeah, we're really concerned. Uh, they're going to, you know, they're going to wipe us out. They're going to wipe you out and all that stuff. Why are they not saying just exactly what you're saying? What is, what is, why don't they just say what really is, is on the mind? Because people think that Kim Jong Un is, uh, he's like a, uh, he's, some, he's crazy, he's a psychotic. They're afraid that he's going to press the trigger and he's going to wipe out the United States. Uh, why doesn't China really talk to the United States, sit down with them and say, this is what he wants to accomplish, instead of making us so fearful where we have to think of prevention, uh, maybe wiping him out completely, uh, and maybe all he wants to do is, you know, talk to us. And why doesn't he talk to us and tell us what his mind is and what he's hoping that the United States and the other countries, what he wants from them? Or China could be their spokesperson. Why aren't they saying this? We have to disentangle a couple of things. One is what China wants and one is what North Korea wants. And third is the way the U.S. reacts. First of all, um, I sometimes say in discussing our foreign policy that our country has attention deficit disorder. We cannot focus on a topic for maybe more than a few minutes. China's foreign policy going back hundreds of years is very long term. There is no rush. There's no reason to do anything quickly because eventually they will get what they want. We can see that in the South China Sea. There is no impetus for China to do anything other than what they're doing, which is give lip service to, yes, we're going to increase the sanctions, but we're really not going to do that. And North Korea continues to exist, aggravating the U.S. The problem has to do with the way that we respond. Calling Kim Jong-un overweight or referring to him as little rocket man is pointless rhetoric, absolutely pointless. When Rex Tillerson said that we should sit down without preconditions, that was the first clear statement of something that I've advocated for a long time. However, then he was countermanded by the National Security Council and the president within 24 hours and told, nope, we have to have preconditions. They have to get rid of their nuclear weapons. They're not going to do that. But we do need to sit down and talk. We aren't willing to do that without preconditions. That's our fault not their fault. Yeah, and I think I talked to you about earlier that um, they want to get rid of their nuclear weapons where they have allowed so many countries, like India, uh, Pakistan, Israel, uh, Germany, England, uh, United States, and probably others that can have nuclear weapons. And you mentioned something because of the United Nations. I mean, um, you know, it, it, it makes no sense because if you allow one, two, three, four, five, whatever, to be able to have nuclear weapons, you know, it, it, I mean, I, I, if, you know, I'm playing, the, as I said, the devil's advocate. If, if you're looking for sense in foreign policy, this conversation is going to be very short. <laughs> so let's take sense and let's take it off the table. Yeah. By the way, it's France that has nuclear weapons, not Germany, by the way. So what the UN said was, as of a certain point, the UN didn't want any more nations to get nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, some are, certainly North Korea is. There's a belief that Iran might be, and since the UN cannot enforce what it wants to do, those nations will continue. So eventually we will have further proliferation. If Iran were to acquire atomic weaponry, I'm sure Saudi Arabia would purchase it as well, and the escalation would continue. In the United Nations Security Council, people will point with alarm, but they won't do anything. So the nuclear genie's out of the bottle. There isn't any way that it can be restrained. Sorry. And they got a lot of their, uh, their uh, nuclear uh, capabilities uh, through Russia, didn't they? Uh, they got them through, uh, actually through Pakistan. Uh, there was something called the Khan Network. Dr. Khan sold capabilities to Iran and sold capabilities to North Korea. Israel got them from France. That was nice. But uh, the Khan group is K-A-H-N, is the one that supplied those two. What about Russia? Uh, not particularly. They did some construction, but the actual uh, technology which is necessary came from Khan and Pakistan.
Okay, and no, and they're and they don't say anything. Pakistan is not saying anything about uh, their, you know, North Korea. It's, it's like, and they're all contributing. I mean, so many people are contributing to um, their capabilities, and everybody's pretending like, oh, not not I said the little red hen. It's 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 kind of uh, interesting how these politics are played out. Nations in essence determine foreign policies based upon what's best for them so it is vested interest for nations so they are acting all these nations who you just referred to are acting in their own best interest it may not correlate with what we would like them to do what we would prefer for them to do but it's consistent with their national interest north korea he wants uh, kim jong un wants a regime continuity he doesn't want to be invaded he's achieving that China does not want to have a democratic country on its border. It's achieving that. They're achieving what they would like to have happen. We don't want things to happen, but the only way we can enforce it would be th at this point through military action, which would be incredibly unwise. Because? Because if there is military conflagration on the Korean Peninsula, the city of Seoul will be destroyed in a matter of minutes, even without nuclear weaponry and the number of millions of people killed will be hard to count. It, it is not an outcome that we want, which gets back to Tillerson's comment about sit down without preconditions, and then at the moment the administration says there is a precondition, hence there is no talks. Do you think if they no preconditions, they will sit and actually talk to us? We don't know because we haven't tried, but it's worth trying because if we don't, talk, if we don't have a conversation, then we're going to convince ourselves that the only option is military. And it's not, because we haven't really tried that option yet. What do you think we're going to do? What do you see the United States finally doing um, at the, you know, at the end, what, at the end game? What do you think the end game is? There's two possibilities, and one frightens me. The one that frightens me is that we will convince ourselves that a preemptive strike against North Korea is justified. And if we do that, I think that that's not good for world peace. The preferred outcome would be to sit down and talk without preconditions. China would be helpful, but not necessary. We certainly would like them there. But at the moment, we're not willing to do that. We insult them, and we say, oh, there's preconditions. Hence, no conversation. If we convince ourselves that it's necessary to do a preemptive military strike, the peninsula is going to be radioactive for a very long time. Why hasn't China really sat down and talked to us and say, "Listen, you know, we understand North. We understand the Asian people. We understand what they need, the type of respect that they need, and this is how you handle them." Why hasn't there been any, uh, say, secret meetings or meetings that haven't been televised? and really sat down and talked with the United States and teach them how to handle a country like North Korea. One of the weaknesses in our foreign policy, and this goes back certainly all the way to Truman, is something called ethnocentrism, which is we believe that the way that we wish to do things is the right way and what your culture is, we really don't care so much. So we don't traditionally like to be lectured on how we should conduct our policy, we assume that this is how it should be done. So the concept of whether it's a long-range perspective, the concept of we need to follow certain protocols, we tend to go, we just want a result, we want an answer. That's the attention deficit disorder sort of like now. I referred to before. The, it sounds like the general... Now over the next 10, 10 seconds, it would, be, would it, be fine. It almost sounds like the general Bumus philosophy, what's good for the U.S. is good for, the United, good for every other country besides, you know, what's good for the United States is good for everybody else. And if we follow that policy, we have fewer friends and more enemies. That's not a good way to proceed. But we've been doing it that way for every we country. Have, we have often acted that way, and that's not in our best interest. Yes, so we, and we, uh, we want everybody to be a democracy, and not everybody is supposed to be a democracy. Not, everybody, not every country is set up for a democracy. There are 193 member nations in the United Nations. A majority of them are not democracies because they choose not to be. Now, you could argue that, wait a minute, a dictator is in charge of this country. However, the country is willing to accept dictatorial rule or autocratic rule. 
the fact that democracy works in the U.S., works fairly well in the U.S., does not mean that it can be transplanted to other countries. Russia, for example, has no democratic tradition at all. They tried it after World War I. It lasted less than two years. They don't have that sort of a tradition. We do. Many nations don't. The concept of, here, let me write a constitution for you like we did in Iraq after we invaded Iraq, that doesn't work because that's not the culture and the tradition of that country. Mm -hmm. And I think the sooner the United States understands that not everybody wants to be a democracy, the better off we will be. And we'll be able to, they'll be able to uh, work together much better. We might have more than eight countries vote with us at the UN when we make some sort of a statement. Yes, Perhaps. because right now yes. the UN doesn't vote for the United States. What I mean, look what happened just recently with the embassy of, of the um, Israeli. They want to be to move the Israeli embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And how many countries voted with us? Was there like eight? Five? That was the eight that I was referring to. The eight, before, eight, right? eight countries yeah. voted for it with us. That brings us. up an interesting point, though. Um, some of the things that President Trump says have cores of truth in the middle, but they're wrapped in rhetoric which makes it difficult. And Jerusalem's a good example. Jerusalem is, in fact, the capital of Israel. That's where the government headquarters are, that's where the government offices are. Mm -hmm. But they say, no, our capital's in Tel Aviv because there is a dispute about who is in control there. So if instead the United States, instead of saying we're gonna move our embassy to Jerusalem, which is the capital and offend you know, two thirds of the world. If we had worked with the folks in Israel to say, we're going to recognize Jerusalem and Netanyahu is going to stop building new settlements so we can talk with the Palestinians, it would have been an incredible step towards peace. But we didn't do that. All we said was, this is what we're gonna do. Take it or leave it. Well, the United Nations voted and most of them left it. Or they could have said, Another thing that uh, I, you know, we're going to put the U.S. Um, embassy in Jerusalem, but we also want to put the, uh, you know, Isra Israeli Arab or or else a Palestinian at their embassy also in Jerusalem. So they would have both people having Jer embassies in Jerusalem, and that would have, I think would work from both sides. Way back in the late 40s when the United Nations said Jerusalem should be an international city under UN control. That actually would have been a good, a good decision, but that's not what happened because there have been a few wars, as you know, in the area, and Israel's taken control of the city now. That's not the condition, but it actually, given the fact that three major religions all look to Jerusalem as important to them, it actually is an international city, but it's not under international control. See, and better people don't know. In the Knesset, there are Arabs that are. They have. Uh, they have roles in the government. They're, the Israeli Arabs have roles in the government. I'm not sure. Do they? Do you know if they have any? Of the Palestinians are in the government. Uh, uh, the Palestinians are not in the government. That's not in the Knesset. No. Mm -hmm. But the Israeli Arabs are in the government. They are, but it's the Palestinians that are the issue. The issue, right. But maybe to have, to bring some of the Palestinians to be part of the Israeli government, to give them some, uh, you know, to make them feel welcome. I know they go to, uh, they go to school, they go to school in Tel Aviv, and they, they go to Hebrew University. There's a lot of, uh, 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 both, uh, there are some Palestinian students there, there's Israeli Arabs that go to the school, and my, my son was a general surgeon in Israel, and he operated on Palestinians, he operated on people that were from the Hamas party. He didn't say, I'm sorry, you're Hamas, you're a Palestinian, you're bleeding, I won't, I won't uh, operate on you. He, of course, operated, and, and he was uh, part of the Israeli uh, medical team at that time. Well, there's a difference between treating people on a sociable, equitable basis and political power. The Palestinians do not have requisite political power against Israel, so it's not a level playing field. Yeah, so maybe that's what they have to do in order to may be on the playing field, that they should 
get some, you know, I think if you, if you give somebody a little bit of power or a little bit, make them feel like you're welcome, I think it would, I think it would open up and make people feel, hey, well, let's, the, you know, having it in Jerusalem, it'll be good for both, you know, bo both uh, peoples in uh, Israel. I think that's, you know, you have to feel welcome. And I think that's uh, what it is. And I right, think. But feeling welcome isn't enough without real political power. And Palestinians don't have that yet. Not yet. But right. maybe, maybe eventually give them a position, you know, in the Knesset. I mean, the Israeli Arabs are, have uh, positions in the. Uh, when Knesset. I say political power, I'm talking about the fact that at the moment the Palestinians do not have a country. That, that is the sort of power I'm talking about, that they are a member of the UN, that, uh, that they have their own country, that they recognize as that, they have their own borders, et cetera. They're nowhere close to that yet. But when w uh, they were, you know, d during the, um, uh, they were given, when they were supposed to be, um, during uh, President Clinton's administration, with Arafat, remember they were shaking hands with the prime minister and uh, Arafat, that was supposed to be accomplished then and they refused. I mean, they have refused. They could have had a, their own state many times, but somehow they always refused and it's almost like they want, they, can't, they just don't want part of, it seems like they want all of. Part of Hamas's doctrine is that they have not yet recognized Israel. And Hamas needs to do that if the process is going to go forward. It's kind of hard to not recognize someone and then have peace negotiations with them. So that's certainly necessary. But whatever mistakes were made in the past, all we can do is say from where we are right now, what's gonna bring us closer to peace. It's similar to the folks, um, the Kurds in Northern uh, Iraq and in Syria. There was a point where Kurdistan, the country of Kurdistan, actually existed after World War I, for a few years. It actually existed, hasn't existed since. The Kurds are still trying to create it. All we can do with them is to say, how can we help you now? The fact you've been deprived of nationhood for close to 100 years, we can't do anything about. But we could certainly work with them now, and it's similar to the Palestinians. Whatever mistakes were made, I can't fix that but we might be able to do something better going forward. Do you, do you see it happening in, say, in within a year or two? Do you see any, do you see them moving closer to a two-state solution? I don't know why they call them states. They could call them two-country solution. I think that would be better. We have two minutes. I see my, um, my engineer here. So we have to talk faster? <laughs> we have two minutes to make this happen. Okay. The, uh, well, first of all, it's not going to happen in two minutes.